Well, thank you very much, George, and uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak with you today um, to give you an update on Fortescue, but more importantly, to talk about the current industrial relations environment in our country and to talk about what we should be doing in terms of the policy setting agenda going forward. Firstly, let me talk to you a little bit about Fortescue. We are a very young company. Our first production was just back in 2008. So our oldest mine is six years old and our youngest mine is not yet six months old. We are just developing our business and we have used innovation and technology to construct and ramp up our mines in the quickest possible time. Today, we're producing at a rate of 155 million tonnes per annum, and already in the life of our project, we've shipped more than 360 million tonnes to our customers in Asia. Now, that 155 million tonnes per year that we're producing, if it wasn't for Fortescue, would have been lost to this country. The, in developing our project and ramping up to 155 million tonnes, we have not displaced, slowed down or stopped any of the other developments in iron ore in Australia. So the 155 million tonnes of iron ore, the 10,000 jobs that we've created here in Western Australia, the $2 billion paid in royalties and federal income tax, the 1,000 Aboriginal employees that we've engaged from around our local communities, and the $1.5 billion a year, um, $1.5 billion in contracts that we've written with Aboriginal companies and their joint venture partners would have been lost to Australia. So the impact of our project has been very significant for the state and for Australia. And we want to see that continuing into the future. Can you turn those mics off, mate? Um, because we're not stopped there by a long shot. We have a large and growing resource base with over 12 billion tonnes of hematite and more than 5 billion tonnes of magnetite in our uh, portfolio. But that future is all about our position on the global cost curve. To be competitive in our resources business, we have to outrun the competition. Now already, we've come from a position of in the top half of the global supply curve for iron ore to down to the, towards the, the end where we want to be, the bottom quartile. But that is not a fixed game. This is a very dynamic business. And if you look there, the green bar is Vale the biggest iron ore producer in the world. And an iron ore company, by the way, that was started back in the 80s by Japan, our major customer, because of concerns about reliability and competitiveness of supply from Australia. So Vale and all of the tonnes that it produces as the biggest um, iron ore producer in the world was a direct result of unreliability and lack of competitiveness in Australia. Vale have continued their move down. They're already caught up some of the distance that we put between them. So we have to understand that in the game of resources, which is so critical for Western Australia and Australia, then we're not fixed. We need to continue working to improving our cost position. And I have a concern in that journey of what's happening in terms of industrial action in Australia. There have been the winds of change, and we can see from 2007 through to 2013, over that period, we've seen a massive increase in days lost due to industrial action. This, I, I would put to you, is a return to the bad old days. This is a return to the mid-80s and early 90s that saw the destruction of so much of the competitiveness of our industry. So let's look at it in some of the broad terms. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to have this graph as, as a indicator of our industry. The mining industry is going backwards in productivity terms. Despite all of the investment, all the new technology, all of the innovation that's been brought into mining, we're going backwards. 
And you see up the top, agriculture leads the pack in terms of productivity improvements in Australia. And it's interesting to note that the average wage in the agricultural sector in Australia is around 50,000 per year. The average wage in mining is 120,000 per year. And yet the productivity we've seen is the direct reverse of that. But let's put wages in context, and we heard some of our previous speakers talk about the MUA dispute. And I'm not going to back away from that, because I am close to the detail. It is critically important, not only for Fortescue and all of our employees, but also for the state and for the Commonwealth. Let's put the MUA deckhand's wage position in, um, in perspective. You can scan through that list and look at the relativities there. And I ask you to think about the level of formal training, including university degrees, the years of experience that it takes to fill some of those positions, and compare that to the four formal days of training that it requires to become a deckhand at Port Hedland. So what's wrong with our system that we can have this happen. And what's happening in terms of the MUA dispute? Well, let me focus in on that dispute for a moment. Because this is a, a dispute that doesn't just occur between the employees and the employer. If it did, you'd say, well, fair enough. Let them duke it out. This is what industrial relations is all about. And we should let these guys negotiate an outcome. But in this case, we've got a very small group of people who have extreme monopoly power over not only their employer, but the, all of the companies that use that port, all of the employees through the Pilbara whose companies use that port, the Western Australian taxpayer and the federal taxpayer. And it's not just about the impact to mining companies. This impacts on people. And for us at Port Hedland, we are a single commodity business. Our entire revenue stream and cash flow is dependent on those ships going out every day. So when the shiploaders stop, so does our cash flow. And we don't have the ability to sustain periods of shutdown where we're not getting any cash flow in. We have used debt to expand our business. We need the cash flow from operations to service our business and to repay that debt. If we look at the impact, and this is just from a Fortescue perspective, the impact of stoppage on the state and federal government is a massive cost. And I'm going to put this in, conte in context for you now. Let's zero in on the state and now expand it to look at the loss from both Fortescue and BHP, who both combined with Atlas and a couple of others around 100 million tonnes of export revenue through that port every single day. For the state government, they lose $7 million a day in royalty. And you say, well, that doesn't sound that much. Let's put it in the context of the West Australian budget. In three days, the strike would cost the West Australian taxpayer the entire 2015 budget for the homeless in Western Australia, in just three days. In just those same three days, it will cost the construction of a primary school in just three days of stoppage. That money has to be found from other taxpayers within the state. That's the impact of this strike. And you say, well, they could go to the, gov the federal government, but the federal government is losing four to five times that in terms of lost income tax, depending on how many people are left employed. But perhaps the biggest impact, the biggest impact of all, is on our reputation. It is about reliability of supply and competitive supply that our customers depend on us. That's what they're looking for. And we shouldn't underestimate the impact that this has on our customers and their future plans. And it doesn't happen immediately. It takes years or even decades for these changes to take place. So we've got to be very careful that short-term greed and short-term gain is not being put ahead 
of long-term development of our economy and jobs for our kids and our grandkids. Let's have a look at the coal industry, another industry that I'm very, very familiar with and one that has suffered dreadfully at the hands of our industrial relations policy over the years. This is the picture for coal in Australia. Our coal industry is on its knees. Our coal industry is suffering because new supply has been brought into the global coal market to compensate for the lack of competitiveness and the unreliable supply that comes out of our Australian coal business. It's a direct result that has caused the development, particularly in Indonesia, where it was seen as more industrially stable and more competitive to develop coal mines there. And we've seen just in 2014 around 10 coal mines close in Australia with the loss of over 2,500 jobs. And you can say, well, maybe they would have happened anyway, perhaps they were bad management decisions, perhaps the ore bodies were uneconomic. And yes, all of those things are a factor in this. But it is a direct result of the increased supply from other countries that has lost that business to the Australian economy. It's a direct result of that that we've seen the growth of those coal mines to replace our supply and a direct result again of the industrial environment that existed here in the Pilbara in the 80s that developed Vale, the largest iron ore producer in the world. So what's wrong with our industrial relations system and what is it that we're looking for? Well, I agree wholeheartedly that we need an industrial relations system and industrial law that protects the little guys. I absolutely agree with that. But what we're seeing in Port Hedland and so many other places around Australia is the flip side of that. We're seeing extreme monopoly power being used not only to damage and bludgeon employers into submission, but the broader impact across affected companies and the economies in the state and federal arena. So let's take the MUA dispute at Port Hedland, where 54 or 55 people can create such enormous catastrophic havoc through not only their employer, they're almost um, a, a, an afterthought in this, but ourselves, BHP, the tens of thousands of people who are employed through the Pilbara that rely on that single access to market through Port Hedland. Now, if a company did this, if a company used the kind of monopoly power that these individuals have, the regulator would be all over them. They would be in court instantly. They would be fined, they would be penalised, and we would clear them out as, as um, terrible, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, toxic in our economy. And yet, we're happy to see this happen because this is employees. Because an association of employees has that same monopoly power, we're happy for them to wield that. So who is it that our industrial system is protecting? I hear a lot of talk about the swinging pendulum of industrial relations law. Depending on which government in is in, we, we hear about this pendulum. Well, I put to you that we don't want industrial law, which is so critical for our productivity and the future development of our economies, to be a political football that swings one way or another, depending on the colour of the, of the politics that are in, time, in there at that time. So we need to elevate the policy debate and we need to make sure that our politicians understand that we want better performance out of them than this um, simple pendulum swing of payback and payback on payback each term of government that comes along. And we want to look to our Senate to say, you need to stand up and be counted. Again, not for short-termism, but look to the long-term interests of our country and start thinking about an industrial relations system that suits us for today and for the future. And let me leave you with one thought around that. Perhaps the way to think about that is not to reward monopoly power 
in our industrial relations system by paying those with the biggest amount of power to shut down businesses and shut down our economy with the highest wages, but to start thinking about payment for merit and start thinking about those that add the greatest value to our economy and rewarding productivity gains and rewarding greater value add and opportunity within our economy. Because what we need more than anything is to start growing our economy so that we diversify and we build a greater production base, a greater income base right across our economy so that we're protected from the ups and downs of the resource sector and our agricultural sectors which we rely on. And we've seen so much of the other parts of our economy impacted. Our coal business, as I said, it is on its knees. Manufacturing has all but disappeared in Australia and we're now seeing the last of the car plants disappearing and it's because they've not been able to keep, keep up with the times. Lots of complex issues in that, I appreciate, but nevertheless it's another industry lost to Australia. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, again, we are very proud of what we've achieved at Fortescue and we've been able to do that in an environment which has been relatively free from industrial manipulation and industrial sabotage. We want to make sure that the legislation and the environment going forward allows Fortescue's of the future to continue to develop and that they're not developed overseas in another country somewhere and lost to future generations and the economic development of our country. Thank you.